Well, the NFL season is back, and that means your fantasy teams are being put to work. And I can tell you right now, for myself, I am not happy that I started Daniel Jones in my league. But I can tell you what I do like, and that is the Air It Out Fantasy Football League podcast. It's part of the Air It Out podcast network. It's hosted by longtime fantasy football players and friends, Joe and Chantel. And new episodes are released weekly. So every week, you guys are going to be able to get an episode to get your fantasy fill, discussing all things fantasy football and everything noteworthy on the 2023 NFL season. And their highlight segment of the show is show up, show out, or a blank show. I think you know where I'm going with that. Where they make specific player predictions and recommendations and discuss which players show up, show out, or are a complete crap show, for lack of a better word, uh, for the week. And these guys are just getting started. Okay, so they're going to need some love from you guys. Check them out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube, and much more. You can also follow and rate them. Click on the little alarm bell for notifications so you can see when new episodes are released. And you can also find them on Instagram on the Air It Out Network. Of course, the best way is on Apple and Spotify. But in the search, make sure you type in Air It Out FFL. You look for the red and black logo. That's where you'll be able to find them. Again, guys, Air It Out FFL, which is available on Apple and Spotify. Check out the Air It Out Fantasy Football League podcast. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. You're gonna acknowledge me. It is Tuesday, September 12th, 2023. It's time to talk Monday Night Raw. Maybe those of you who are Jet fans out there can uh, take some solace, take some time to talk about a sport that, uh, that, that maybe makes you feel better about your life. And uh, t- take a moment, right? I don't know how many Jet fans we got out there, but boy, uh, you can't you can't write this stuff with uh, Aaron Rodgers going down. But this is not an NFL podcast; it's a WWE podcast, and we are going to be talking about the Monday Night Raw that took place last night in uh, in in Virginia and the scope. We're going to talk about it because a major return happened, and that major return, Nia Jax. We'll talk about that in a minute and my thoughts on it. But as always, if you want to get rid of those ads that you hear all over the place on my show, you can do that for really for free as a seven day free trial anyway on patreon.com slash WWE podcast and Apple podcast. Both offer ad free experiences that also have a free trial attached to them. Try us for a week. If you like us, stick with us. If you don't, well, then you, you tried, right? Uh, but I think if you give it a try, you're going to want to stick around because once you get a taste of ad free, you wonder how you listen to podcasts before. I'm the same way with uh, the, the shows I listen to. But we also have exclusive shows that are going up on the SmackDown tier and above. You can check those out starting on Friday. Anthony DeMarco is going to be moving to exclusively to the SmackDown tier and above. Talking about the After Dark show that will be very adult. Okay, Uh, he'll still be doing current state of WWE, but outside of me reposting some old shows of his, he's going to be exclusive for his solo retro show or rather his solo after dark show is going to be only on Patreon. So be a good time to check that out and get yourself set up so that you don't miss it. All right, let's talk about Monday Night Raw. Hey, let's talk about Nia Jax. But before we get there, let's talk about the match that set it up and uh, of course, Rhea Ripley and Raquel Rodriguez. Now, admittedly, I was very harsh more than others about their match they had at Payback. I was not a big fan of it. It felt clunky. There were some botches that took me out of the moment. And I don't think they had generally great chemistry. I didn't think it was a bomb of a match. It just felt, it felt just clunky is the perfect word for it. And this time around, though, I think these ladies improved improved immensely and and credit to Raquel credit to Rhea they have a similar style of power a similar style of big moves 
dominance, strength, and it was a a uh, a matchup that improved significantly over its predecessor when they faced one another at Payback. And the chemistry is what uh, I think was was you know uh, most improved. The chemistry now that should be expected for most matchups. When you have more time together, you learn each other's maneuvers, what could be coming next, how to counter and make it look good and and work with the different dynamics of that individual. This was a much improved match. Now, I'm not going to call it match of the year, but it was an enjoyable match. Both women beat the hell out of each other. The Tejada bomb on the apron had to have killed uh, Rhea Ripley. They gave each other some some pretty big bumps and uh, had a hell of an effort. And now they they went about I think it was about twelve minutes or so. And then Nia Jax, like an RKO, came out of nowhere and attacked Ra- uh, Raquel Rodriguez and left her laying, and then uh, ended up causing. Raquel to lose to Rhea after Riptide. So the ref didn't see it, but she did cause obviously a, a massive advantage or allow it for a massive advantage for Rhea to get the victory. And then after the match, Rhea standing tall, Naya enters the ring and she headbutts Rhea and then gives her essentially a Vader bomb and uh, leaves Leah or Leah Rhea completely squashed in the middle of the ring. And there's a couple of things that I want to say about this. Number one, a positive. It's always good when you're adding depth to the women's division. It's a good thing. I think that the women have gotten a main event. It's a championship match. It should be the main event. So that's, that's good. The, 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 the division as a whole, not just SmackDown, but raw, need help. And and they went over this last night with Anthony DeMarco in our current state. They they kind of feel directionless, especially SmackDown. But Raw at times has felt like it doesn't know where it's going. The Becky Lynch Trish Stratus saga went on forever. And while we all love the cage match, it was time for that to end and at times was very uninspiring. Now obviously Becky is going to NXT in which at this very moment as I record this, is competing in a match with Tiffany Stratton for the NXT Women's Championship. And that'll be a fun little detour for Becky until she gets rerouted to the main roster to face whoever. And that that's all that's all well and good. And having, again, depth, changing up who has the focus on them is, is a good thing. Returning stars, more often than not, a good thing. Okay, so let me that that's the positives and it also gives Rhea a new opponent. The the kind of negatives or maybe not so much, I'll let you guys decide. The crowd reaction for Nia Jax not great. Now was it supposed to be great? I don't know. Because she attacked both the heel and the babyface. She caused the babyface to lose the match but ultimately attacked the heel. And more often than not, too, when you have a returning star, whether they left her as a heel or a babyface, fans forget and are simply just excited to be there and to see you return while they're there live. So Naya generally got kind of a, 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 a negative reaction, almost a reaction that I could feel that wasn't the heel heat that you're looking for of, uh, you know, oh my God, I, I want to see someone beat her up. Uh, Nia Jax is going to get what's coming to her. This this character makes me you know, want to see a baby face stand up to her and, and kick her in the head. No, the feeling I got, and maybe you guys can second this or not, the, the type of reaction that the crowd gave her was more of just, no, not Nia Jax, please, no. That's kind of the feeling I got, or maybe that was my own head. Maybe I was just projecting my own thoughts onto the crowd. Now, putting all of her outside beliefs and political, uh, you know, proclivities aside, th- just her as a character. Okay, I know she's done a lot of outside activity and made a lot of her beliefs and political leanings public, and that's a discussion for another day. But just Nia Jax, the character. 
Nia Jax, the wrestler. She's not particularly interesting to me. And sure, she has an advantage that I think is well utilized in her size. I don't think it's a negative. I think that, you know, while she is obviously a heavier woman, if you looked at the numbers, probably at least double the average women uh, woman on the roster, at least, maybe triple in some cases. But that's, again, that's not me knocking her. You know, it will lead to more injuries on her part, specifically with her joints, her knees, her ankles, her hips. I mean, it just will because gravity doesn't discriminate. So it's just kind of a fact of life, whether, you know, somebody out there says um, fat shaming or body shaming. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, well, not sorry. It is what it is. It's just truth. Okay. So she's going to have more injuries and she does work at a slower pace. I actually think that's a positive. Okay, there's a positive for you. She's a bigger woman, which means she works slower, which I think in this day and age of a 100 mile an hour pace that everyone seems to need to reach in their matchups, Nia Jax will slow things down. And that's good. I, I do like the pacing of matches occasionally being slower. Every match doesn't need to feel the same. So that's a positive for me. The negative for her again is she's very much more injury prone than somebody who is, you know, not as heavy as she is. Just life, just fact. Um, now uh, the 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 whole injury cloud has been hanging above her head for quite a while. I even knock on it every once in a while, or, or I kind of knock on her every once in a while for that. And I have never claimed though that Nia Jax purposefully has ever injured anyone outside of. She's had a couple of spats with Charlotte in the ring that were real, and you can go watch those. But the injuries that actually occurred, I don't believe any of them were purposeful. Okay, She was just, I think, in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, bad execution. And, and there are some, there is some fault to be laid at the, the feet of her opponents, too. I don't think she's really solely at fault. She's been she's kind of become the face of the women's injury the 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 women's IL if you will and and almost to an unfair degree because again she's been involved in a lot of injuries now that is a risk it is and i think the fact that she's a much she's strong as hell and she's a bigger woman and works a much different style than most of the rosters used to working that does also pose a risk so you may continue to see additional injuries, not purposeful, on uh, in matches with Nia. So that's that's the the kind of outside storyline stuff. Now inside the storyline, you know you you have all these other women beyond Nia, that Zia Lee, for example, Tegan Knox, uh, Alba Fire, Isla Dawn, all these women among others that have come up and. WWE has no idea what the hell to do with them. And instead of giving them an opportunity to, f- to face Rhea to help build them, uh, build them up and build a name for themselves, they bring back Nia Jax, of which there was no real, I don't think there was ever a grassroots organic movement to, to, to want to bring Nia Jax back. I mean, I know she made a cameo appearance at the Rumble, and then she went back into hiding, <laughs> and then she reappeared here. So she went from January to September, and I just don't feel like fans were super excited to see her. Now it's not she. I don't think that she will take away from the women's division. But is she really going to add anything that was missing? Because we already had a power versus power Rhea and Raquel matchup. Presumably, what's going to happen here, given that Raquel was screwed out of the belt, and that Rhea was also attacked by Nia, and she doesn't have any alliance here. You would imagine it's a triple threat at fast lane for the women's chi- women's title. You would imagine that's where they're going. And to their credit, that is a very interesting matchup that I don't think I've ever seen in the women's division of three powerhouse women going toe to toe, beating the hell out of each other, slow pace, but you know, just muscling each other around. That is intriguing to me. I, I don't think, you know, to, to see Nia Jax go face to face with Raquel Rodriguez 
is 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 intriguing from a power standpoint. Um, but we, we've kind of we've already seen this dynamic with Raquel and Rhea. So now we're going to duplicate that that dynamic with Nia Jax and a slower, much slower pace than, and then Raquel even has. Um, also, you know, again, when you look at the, the women that have been left out of this, it's kind of maddening. Uh, and, and Becky Lynch continues to be out of the sights of Rhea Ripley and vice versa for the time being. It seems like they're saving Becky Lynch and Rhea Ripley for, I don't know, I would say Survivor Series, but maybe well beyond that. They know it's a match they have in their back pocket. Same with Bianca Belair versus Rhea Ripley that has not happened yet. These matchups they know they have in the bank, ready to fire out whenever they need to. Of course, Bianca, I guess, is, I think she is injured currently. So my whole wrap of this with Nia Jax is I don't love it. I'm always willing to give things a chance before I say worst thing in the world. No, I'm going to see. Let's play it out. I don't believe she's going to become champion. I don't think Nia Jax should become champion at this point. I don't think anybody in the women's division other than Rhea should be champion right now. Rhea Ripley, uh, you know, has been kind of sidelined in a weird way since WrestleMania. But even though she's involved in one of the most formidable groups in WWE, she's hasn't had her own real, real program until Raquel. So you can pretty much bank on a triple threat at Fastlane, and that should be a very interesting dynamic, a show of power, who can lift who, the crowd going, oh my God, right? It's going to be a fun matchup because it's going to feel so much different than the typical women's match or typical triple threat. So I'll leave it there. All right. Now we're going to move on to uh, the beginning of the show with Jey Uso. <clears throat> and let me just say, I know a lot of you say, oh, well, you didn't comment on this or that on Raw. Well, you didn't talk about this. What about that? That's fine. I mean, just know up front, I'm not going to get to everything that happened in the show. It's not feasible with my time frame. So if there is and are things that you you think to yourself, wow, he didn't talk about that? How did he miss this? What happened here? Just send it to the mailbag. That's a great time for me to answer your specific Raw questions, okay? So you can go to uh, uh, my mailbag, which is mailbag at wwepodcast.com. Or if you're a patron, you just send me a direct message in the system. That's also a great way. Uh, and patrons get priority su- priority support, priority placement in the mailbag. So that's just a disclaimer here. Send me specific questions if I don't answer them about Raw or I skip over something. All right, so Jey Uso comes out. Massive reaction. Maybe his biggest reaction to date and it's, it's uh, really specifically since he's left the bloodline. And uh, he said it felt good to be out of the bloodline on his own and to be on, of course, Monday Night Raw because we always have to announce the show we're watching, which is just ridiculous. Um, Kevin Owens made his entrance quickly and said that Jay is now on the KO show. He's been where Jay Uso has been. And he said there's a lot of people that don't want him on Raw, Jay, that is. He mentioned that Matt Riddle and Drew said they, uh, and said they weren't alone. And Owen said Cody wanted him there and Sammy welcomed him with open arms, but that's it. Owen said Jay had to prove to him he's not the same guy he was when he ran with the bloodline. Uh, Then the judgment day came out and Priest said he knew that Jay would need some time to figure out if he wants to join the bloodline as an invitation, or rather the uh, the judgment day, as an invitation was extended. And uh, Dom tried to speak. But the the fans are just not letting him talk. I I, I mean I, I'm kind of split now on the whole Dom booing him off the mic thing, because as fans or I, I, look look at this or listen to this, if you're WWE, that's the kind of heat you dream of that you can't buy from fans. That's the kind of heat that is so rare. But is it more just the fans going into business for themselves, following a trend? I, I don't think so here because you know, Dom is so disliked naturally. This is just pure heat that we haven't seen in a long time that they don't even want to hear him talk. Now, the the other side of this is as a fan at home, you're like, well, I kind of want to know what he's saying. And if I'm Dom, I'm thinking to myself, cool. I mean, I don't have to pressure myself to cut a promo every week on Raw because even if I, if I screw up in my promo, no one's going to hear it. 
You know, like uh, I could stutter my words, not say the right things. And no one's sitting there going, wait, what did Dom say? I really want to know because he can't hear it anyway. So what he says is almost irrelevant. That almost hinders him as uh, to develop as a character, though, does it not? As fans, we hate him so much we don't want him to talk. At the same time, we're hurting his progression as a as a character because we can't we won't allow him to talk and hear what he says to say. So it's a double edged sword here. I'm of the belief that you know, and if I had the power, that I would tell the fans, you know, boo him on upon entrance. Boo him a little bit, you know, uh, when he starts to talk, but don't do it to the level where it drowns out what he's saying. I want him to get better on the mic, but he can't get better on the mic if he's constantly not given an opportunity and, and is just completely showered with booze. So it's, it, I, I honestly don't know. Um, at the same time, this is the heat that you want to get. This is what heels dream of. Some heels in their entire career won't even sniff this kind of heat. So... All right. Anyway, there's a uh, pre said there was supposed to be a match with Zane and question where he was. Owen said that Zane wasn't there and that's why he was dressed for a fight. And eventually, you know, it came down to Jay and Owens that would face the uh, tag team champions of Finn Balor and Damian Priest. Of course, non title here. And this match was about 12. Well, no, it was. It was 12 and a half minutes and it ended with Balor uh, tagging in and took the middle rope brain buster from Owens. Priest broke up the pin, though. Priest suffered a stunner from Owens. Jay tried to super kick Priest, who moved. That caused Owens to take the super kick from Jay. Key moment there. And Priest and Owens fought ringside while Balor hit the coup de gras, or if you pronounce it phonetically, this is how it actually, if you spell out coup de gras, here's how it would actually sound phonetically. It sounds ridiculous. Coupe de grace. So maybe I'll just start calling it that and uh, add some PJ McDonough in there for you guys. <laughs> so, all right. So yeah, Balor hit the coupe de grace on Owens and pinned him. And s- somewhere out there, someone's getting secondhand embarrassment. Um, and then uh, after the match, Cole said that what happened with Jay seemed innocent enough, but people don't trust him due to his history. Jay tried to talk to Owens, who glared at him and then limped to the back without him. So it continues to, to push the story ahead of distrust of Jay and the roster. I like it. It makes sense. I mentioned this last week, but it continues to be pushed, and it should. The bloodline made a lot of enemies along the way. And everyone isn't supposed to just, you know, uh, give him the, the grace and forgiveness because he shows up on their show. You know, and if honestly I was looking at this objectively or logically, Cody Rhodes was, uh, you know, uh, somehow had a hand in bringing him to Raw. He was. He was, uh, you know, gunning for him to come to Raw, and he got him to Raw using his magical political powers. What's in it for Cody? He just brought a guy into the roster, of which the majority of the roster doesn't trust, <laughs> um, and with good reason. How does Cody benefit from this? Why were we told that Cody had anything to do with this? What is his vested interest? I know Cody was lobbying for Jay to get here. Why? Why? I mean, I'm imagining they'll never get to that. But there's other than, I mean, here's the real answer. They want that that move and the credit of that move to go to Cody because they know it's a very positive move in the eyes of fans. And therefore, you're associating all good things with Cody and Cody is involved in all good decisions. But... I mean, I see right through that, and I know a lot of you guys do too. All right, um, let's move on. Backstage, Jay did try to apologize to Owens, and Owens said they are in the Judgment Day locker room, and he, he basically told Jay to go find his new bloodline and then dye his hair purple. That was funny. Um, so the, the the distrust and discord continues between Jay and Owens and others. Okay, The Miz versus Akira Tozawa. Quick match here, two minutes. Miz got the victory, 
uh, with the the skull crushing finale, and that's pretty much it here. I did not see any other um, anything else that happened in this match. This was not on Hulu with good reason, but uh, yeah, no uh, no LA Knight here, which is okay. You know what? I actually like the fact that LA Knight's not going to be on every single show. You know, that that's part of the mystique and reaction that Roman gets, even though he's a heel, is that he's on very rarely. Now, I don't want LA Knight to go on a Roman Reigns schedule, but if he's not there every week, builds anticipation for when he does show, and I think there's a larger reaction when he takes a, a week or two off. Um, do I think they'll do that? Probably not, but something to think about. All right. Moving on here, uh, we got Jackie Raymond Redmond interviewing Shayna, and Baszler said Zoe Stark surprised her in the match last week. Chelsea Green showed up and said she was looking for a partner because Piper Niven isn't medically cleared. Baszler said she could meet Green in the ring and show her limb by limb exactly how large the gap is between them. Green turned around, and Piper Niven was standing right there. Uh, Green said she was happy to see her and knew she was coming back tonight. Niven took one of the WWE Women's Tag Team title belts and said, medically cleared before walking away. So, yeah, um, interesting. We maybe have the curse broken here of the women's tag belts being, you know, just snake bit. All right. Then we got a really cool, and I, I love this visual. This is This should go on you know some kind of some kind of museum whoever is you know good at painting pictures or memorializing moments this was a beautiful visual of gunther and his and uh, giovanni vinci and ludwig kaiser who accompanied him and got you know took him out of the car and, and walked with him to the into the ring and the um, the white pillars they had set up in the ring and also Man, they look good in suits. Tell me Gunther in a suit isn't one of the sharpest looking dudes you've ever seen. Now, I'm a straight dude, all right? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get any tingling anywhere for, for Gunther. But the dude's a, a good looking dude in a suit. He is as sharp as a tack. I mean, he, he's just, he cleans up so well in a suit. Now, he's not sloppy without it. But you only see him in his ring gear. You never see him in normal clothing, much less a suit. I'm not saying for him to, to go full Cody Rhodes every week, but every once in a while, if, if Gunther wants to wear a suit and his, his group wants to wear a suit, I think it's an awesome look. I, I really enjoy it. it. It made him even more of a champion to me. I think it, it elevated him in that moment to make him feel even more legit. So, um, but this didn't last long as, you know, somebody was going to interrupt and Chad Gable. Oh, well, before that, Gunther boasted how he's now the longest reigning intercontinental champion in history. And he wanted to give credit to uh, um, those who, who came before him. But then he turned and said that uh, they actually contributed nothing that uh, he is the one who elevated the belt to new heights, never seen before. And he's running out of competition and he's only going to compete against himself. And then enters Mr. Shoosh, Chad Gable. And he got interrupted or he interrupted Gunther. Gable walked out with a mic and uh, said that they had a main event for the ages. He said that the world wouldn't stop talking about it. And, And now Already a small complaint here. I don't need to hear about tearing the house down. We killed it in the main event. Those phrases imply you're working together. And now we know you are, but don't tell us. We want the magic to, to even a fragment of it to remain so we can get invested here. So whenever we hear that of making history, tearing the house down, stealing the show, you know, having the best match, uh, n- no, 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 no. Those are byproducts that the fans will decide and the fans pick up on. Even the announcers, if they say it isn't, it's not the end of the world, but for the wrestlers themselves to be talking about having great matches, 
it's it's something you just don't say. You're saying the quiet part out loud. Leave it alone. We will tell you when you've had great matches, not you. And also, it's pulling back the curtain every time you say it. Um, so, uh, we're going to take a quick break for the sponsor of the episode today, guys. Which, by the way, if you are a patron, right now, you're just going to be treated to the next part of the show without the ad. But for those of you on the free feed, we're going to give the sponsor of the show a little bit of love right now. And then we're going to dive into some of the things that Gable said to Gunther that really didn't make a whole lot of sense and that Gunther could have easily snapped back at. So I'll give you my thoughts on that right after this. Well, the NFL season is back, and that means your fantasy teams are being put to work. And I can tell you right now, for myself, I am not happy that I started Daniel Jones in my league. But I can tell you what I do like, and that is the Air It Out Fantasy Football League podcast. It's part of the Air It Out Podcast Network. It's hosted by longtime fantasy football players and friends, Joe and Chantel. And new episodes are released weekly. So every week, you guys are going to be able to get an episode to get your fantasy fill, discussing all things fantasy football and everything noteworthy on the 2023 NFL season. And their highlight segment of the show is show up, show out, or a blank show. Like, you know where I'm going with that where they make specific player predictions and recommendations and discuss which players show up, show out, or are a complete crap show, for lack of a better word, uh, for the week. And these guys are just getting started, okay? So they're going to need some love from you guys. Check them out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube, and much more. You can also follow and rate them. Click on the little alarm bell for notifications so you can see when new episodes are released. And you can also find them on Instagram on the Air It Out Network. Of course, the best way is on Apple and Spotify. But in the search, make sure you type in Air It Out FFL. You look for the red and black logo. That's where you'll be able to find them. Again, guys, Air It Out FFL, which is available on Apple and Spotify. Check out the Air It Out Fantasy Football League podcast. All right, welcome back. And let's talk a little bit about what G- Gable said to Gunther. Uh, and Gable came in the ring. And he said that no one has come as close to beating him as Gable did. And he said he saw the same look on the faces of his entire family, including his oldest daughter, Briella, who had tears in her eyes caused by Gunther. Now, this is where I think Gunther could have clapped back easy and buried uh, buried Gable by saying, no, you're the one that caused your daughter to cry because you weren't man enough to beat me if you were so talented and you're so superior why you know you would have beaten me and prevented your uh you prevented your daughter from crying so your daughter's tears are your responsibility for not being able to beat me you know he could have easily turned it around instead of gable you know said that gunther uh caused his daughter to cry but all did all Gunther did was win the match. He didn't go after the match and try to snap his neck or anything. Like he didn't do anything extracurricular. He just simply beat the hell out of uh, out of Gable and won. But you know, this did break down, and it broke down after uh, you know Gable said that Gunther lit a fire under him and he's going to make everything right, and that he will beat Gunther and take the title. Uh, Gable said he didn't know when, where, or how, but he would get another title shot, and he swore to God he would win the championship for himself, his career, and his family. And uh, Gable swore that his daughter would walk out with a smile on her face. And then Gunther asked if Gable wanted another opportunity to have his family travel to the show to see him take the biggest beating of his life and accused Gable of using his kids as bait. And then that's he called him a terrible father. He's disgusting. It was actually, I God, I love Gunther. Uh, Gable punched him, and then all hell ensued. And um, Otis ran out, and Tommaso Ciampa ended up evening the odds after even Otis was overwhelmed and had a chair and chased off Imperium. I don't know what, and even the announcers didn't know what the vested interest of Tommaso Ciampa is with this and what he, you know, it just seems like another random thing for Tommaso Ciampa to do. Uh, one of many that he's been doing since he came to the roster. 
of heel face in between not sure with Bronson Reed and Shinsuke, but also the Miz and like what, what I don't know what we're doing here with Tommaso Ciampa. My assumption though, is if this is an actual storyline for Tommaso or for Ciampa rather to sink his teeth into finally, and not just this kind of, well, we need to put you somewhere. So we'll get you minutes and here you go. If this is actually something for Ciampa, I think maybe he joins Imperium. I think maybe that's what he does uh, because him as a baby face right now is what he, well, that's currently what he is. God knows what he's going to be next week. That seems to not be the best course of action for him. I think him joining and turning would be the best way. Now does Gunther need a third guy? No, but it would give champ an opportunity to shine in a spotlight that he needs. And it would also give a group of four guys some more, uh, you know, some more swagger. Now, there is an overload of heel groups on, in WWE as a whole, no doubt about it. There's a lot, a lot of heel groups floating around. Not too many babyface groups. What, what, what are the babyface groups? LWO. You know, like what, what? That's kind of it, because the heel groups, Judgment Day, what's left of the Bloodline. You know, um, so. It's uh, it, it's just kind of there's you know we got got a lot of groups, but it's something. It's just a a theory I have about Champa. But all right, then we got the recap of Woods and McIntyre earlier in the day, and uh, Woods accused McIntyre of being upset that Kingston won the world championship, his world championship in front of eighty two thousand screaming bodies, where McIntyre won his in an empty uh, performance center. And McIntyre said he didn't want to hurt Woods, but then promised whatever happens tonight wouldn't be an accident. I really like this by McIntyre. No more fooling around with Riddle. Riddle had, you know, Riddle seems to be a bit of a liability. There was an incident at the airport that I'm sure you guys can Google. Every time he turned around, Riddle's doing something that, uh, you know, whether it's his fault or not, he's just kind of running into bad luck or, you know, the, the whole uh, Candy Cartwright thing. Remember the whole that, that all deal. That has never really uh, washed away, and he's probably on a very tight leash with management, and rightfully so. But McIntyre could benefit greatly from no riddle. This is the McIntyre I like. This is the one I like, this version of him. Not playing big brother to somebody, but just being a legit badass. And having Woods also show what he can do in the ring. I can't stand his his character. I despise everything the New Day stand for. They're one of the most embarrassing, worst groups to ever uh, come into existence from a character perspective. Now, I understand Kofi won the belt. Kofi Mania, all that. I understand that. But McIntyre and Woods put on a really good match here. I, I enjoyed this. I wish it could have gone longer. It was just about 10 minutes. Even a This Is Awesome chant broke out. And credit to both men. You know, um, credit to both men in this matchup because they made this match. They made every second count in this match. Uh, now, we did get a Claymore by McIntyre that led to the three counts, so Drew wins clean. Uh, I don't know what this is, end game is here, but I like this little mini program. It, it's, it's really nice, and I hope that Xavier and Kofi do less talking and trombone flailing that they've done for nine years and get in the ring. Okay, even as single stars, they don't need to break up and feud. They can just quietly break up and do their own singles deal. Um, but you see what Xavier is capable of in the ring, and you're like, why? Why aren't we getting this again? Why? Why is he just being relegated to flailing a trombone every week? You know. So, all right. Let's see. We then got oh God, uh, Cody Rhodes coming out, and of course. He has to try to make fetch a thing and uh, say, what do you want to talk about? Like a, a damn fool. And uh, Cody said they would talk about Jey Uso. You, by the way, did you even notice this week was even more egregious when he asked what they want to talk about? The crowd didn't respond. They just go, there was some noise, but again, the crowd doesn't know what to do because you can't do anything. It's like me, uh, you know, getting on the mic and saying, so Cincinnati, what do you guys want for dinner? There's going to be 50 different answers. You know, you can't ask an open-ended question. 
you fool. It's not a thing. <sighs> All right. Anyway, Cody did talk about Jay. He said before they could say more, or before he could say more, rather, Dom and JD made their entrance, and Dom spoke over the booking crowd, uh, booing crowd, and said they wanted to talk about how happy he is that Cody brought Jay to Raw. And uh, Dom and McDonough entered the ring and said that Jay would, would join Judgment Day and make Cody look like a fool. And Dom told Cody there isn't a thing Cody could do about it. And uh, Dom was toying with Cody's necktie. And then Cody laid him out. McDonough came, hit Cody from behind. And then Cody cleared McDonough from the ring and hit Cody the Cody cutter on Dom. McDonough rushed back to the ring and took the crossroads. And when Dom stood up, Cody put him down with crossroads and then they all fled up the ramp. So uh, this was, I mean, seeing Cody, you know, of course, stick to his own and not need any help. It, it, it's a sign of a strong baby face. I mean, to take out one of your top two heels, one of your top two heels, uh, it, it's, it's a statement by WWE. And Cody is it really good in the ring. He's very flexible, surprisingly, with that suit. I don't know if that suit is secretly made of some kind of nylon or something. I don't know. Um, but, you know, he moves very fluidly in a suit. So, um, you know, and, and the crowd was, was very much behind him. Very much. And hitting the crossroads again. How many people can hit a crossroads in a suit? Not too many. Short list. But... Um, yeah, you know, the only thing again, the, the crossroads and th this isn't me crapping on the crossroads, although I still think it's a terrible looking finisher, a terrible looking Cody's the one that takes the most of the, most of the, the brunt of the bump there, but that's beside the point. JD took it the best he could. Uh, but Dom immediately after hitting, getting crossroads hit on him, just kind of stumbled out to the ring and like held his neck. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, you just took a finisher. You should be knocked out. Like you should be having to be dragged back. Instead, he, you know, uh, got out of the ring and then held his neck like he just took a clothesline. I mean, you just got your a finish hit on you. So I, I, that was just a small misstep, I think, by Dom not selling it properly. I mean, you got hit with a finish. So, but I, I don't know what they're building to here, and it feels like Cody's directionless right now. He's he's got his hands in everything. He doesn't. They don't know what to do with him. He's cutting promos about Jey Uso, of which again has, he should have no interest in. And suddenly he can make moves to the on the roster front. Um, you know he, he's involved in, in constantly helping Sammy and Kevin, um, but then also he seems to be solo against Dom and and and, and Finn and Damian. Like I I don't know what this is about Finn or uh, Cody Rhodes. I, they just don't have anything for him right now. Uh, but all right, moving on. Uh, McIntyre told Jey Uso he didn't trust him. Jay said, cool. And they're going to have a match next week, which is going to be fun. Jey Uso and Drew McIntyre. Here's my prediction for that match. Uh, wonky finish. Schmaz finish. Why? Neither man can afford to lose clean. So there's some interference no doubt about it that's going to happen in this match. Uh, maybe Judgment Day gets involved or something like that. But there's just no way this is ending clean because both men are on the, it's on the ascent right now. Shane Baszler and Chelsea Green, one-on-one. -on -one. Baszler beats Green in a minute and 50 seconds. And then uh, after the match, Niven and Baszler fought and Zoe Stark came out and drilled Niven with a kick. Baszler hit Green with a knee strike, and then Baszler and Stark approached Niven, who rolled out of the ring. Okay. Shinsuke Nakamura. He comes out. Well, he doesn't come out. He has a video package aired where he asked if people would still sing Seth Rollins' song if they remember the things he's done. And footage aired of Ro uh, Rollins hitting Roman Reigns in the back with a chair. By the way, can anyone... Here's a challenge for everyone right now everyone listening in the sound of my voice you can email me mailbag at wwpodcast.com because i'm interested in this question in the last 10 years can anyone name another piece of footage that wwe has aired more than seth rollins hitting roman reigns in the back with that steel chair to end the shield is there another single piece of footage another single moment 
There's been a lot of them over the last 10 years. Is there another that has happened in the last 10 years that it, you've seen more? It's not a complaint. This is not me complaining, whining. No, it's just, it's, I thought about it. And I'm like, how many times have you seen that piece of footage? Um, it, it's classic. It's, it's etched in, you know, history, uh, the annals of time in WWE, no doubt about it. But boy, have we seen a lot of it. And they've got their money's worth out of that shot, no doubt. Um, but then uh, Nakamura said the road to Seth's success is lined with bodies, the bodies of those who trusted him. And Nakamura said Rollins believes the weak exist to be consumed by the strong. And Rollin, he called Rollins a manipulator, a deceiver, and a liar. He said Rollins brings shame upon his family and he has no remorse. And that he will strip Rollins of the title and expose the lies he claims to stand for. And he will challenge Rollins, quote, when he feels like it. Really good. Uh, I would thought that they were going to announce something for Fastlane, but, you know, we're still a few weeks out. I understand that they're not about booking too far out. They they want to have all their, their ducks in a row and make sure there's no last minute changes and all that. But eventually we're going to get that match. It has to be at Fastlane, does it not? But the content of this was good. It you know, makes sense. It exposes Rollins for who he, he was. Maybe not necessarily who he is, but Rollins said he's a fighter and a world champion, and there was a time he didn't know who he was. And um, he said he surrounded himself with people who lied to him when he was in the authority. He talked about trying to be what the fans wanted and finally figured out that it was just myself. He even talked about the Messiah, all that. I actually like the Monday Night Messiah. I got to say, I know a lot of you out there like this version of Seth, and I understand it. But the Monday Night Messiah, I love the entrance music. Uh, I know it wasn't very sing-alongable like the his is now. But I really enjoyed the Monday Night Messiah that I think had it not been in the pandemic, you would have seen a, uh, a much maybe a more lengthy version. I think there was more juice to squeeze out of the Monday night Messiah. I enjoyed it. Uh, that was the whole deal. With, I think buddy Murphy, right? So anyway, he, 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 the, the only problem I remember with that was he was a Messiah with no disciples at times, like more, well, more often than not, he was a, 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 a Messiah with no disciples, no followers. You can't, you can't call yourself a Messiah and not have anyone following you, but I digress. So, he, he was very meta here, very fourth wall breaking. He says he can now look his daughter in the eyes and be at peace with his past and be proud of his future. And that uh, you know, he wanted to fight. He challenged Shinsuke again. Shinsuke comes out, uh, or rather his, his music played, but he didn't come out. And then uh, Nakamura appeared on the big screen and he was beating up Ricochet. And Nakamura said Rollins has bad timing and... Uh, Rollins isn't medically cleared, so he fought already, and Nakamura then was beating up Ricochet, um, but said, so so sorry, I will take your title, but not today. So the interesting part of this is twofold. Number one, how many times do you see a title program in which the champion is trying to force the challenger to have a title match? Number two is that Rollins showed absolutely no interest in saving Ricochet, who helped him the previous week and then you know, Rollins doesn't want to return the favor. So that's the other part of this. Does this turn to Ricochet getting mad at Rollins and there's a, there's some tension there? Maybe. But I doubt it. That's what you get from being Mr. Uh, clean cut moral compass Ricochet. Okay. We then got Imperium. I know I'm skipping over some stuff, guys, but uh, Imperium and Giovanni Vinci versus... Uh, that is Giovanni Vinci Love with Kaiser and Gunther versus Champa, Gable, and Otis. And this ended in 13 minutes and 30 seconds with Imperium uh, losing. And the finish of this match was that Gable hit Chaos Theory on Vinci. Gunther broke it up. Gable caught Vinci in the ankle lock again, and then he Gunther tried to break it up, but Champa caught him with a, in, in a submission hold and Da Vinci. Uh, uh, Giovanni Vinci, not Da Vinci, my God, uh, tapped out. So Giovanni Vinci loses, and uh, this is a fun. It's a fun program here. I actually didn't think they'd go back to Gable and Gunther 
for a fourth time. I really didn't. I don't hate it. Um, but I also, you know, I don't, I don't hate it from this perspective. You, you know what you're going to get a quality, pure wrestling match, hard hitting, physical, old school, not a hundred miles an hour. No, 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 not, not millions of flip flops and flies. I love that. But also, you know, you, you would imagine Gable's not going to win here, but now that Gunther has past the finish line of of being the longest running intercontinental champion of all time there is a significant chance that anyone faces him from here on out is going to beat gunther now i again i hope not unless the plan is have him drop the belt and go after the world title that's that's cool with me so if that's the plan sure put the title on uh, on um, on gable and whoever takes this belt to is going to be the beneficiary of a lot of equity built up in that belt. There's, there's a lot of meaning behind that right now. It's not just your, you know, a prop anymore that, that it got relegated to be for years. So Gable could really benefit from it. So there is a, there's a significant chance he could win. All right. Again, a lot of backstage stuff. Tiffany Stratton complained to Adam Pierce and that's when Lynch showed up and she or they signed a contract for the NXT Women's Championship match, and uh, so that that'll be taking. Actually, it already took place. I don't know the outcome, so we'll get that from Memphis Mark, who will be doing our NXT review here on uh, the, the feed. So, you know, after that, of course, we got the the main event in having uh, Nia Jax return. But uh, you know, overall, a decent version of Monday Night Raw, one that is going to be remembered for Nia Jax returning. And, you know, I gave my thoughts like for 15, 20 minutes, the open to show my open of the show about that. But let me know what you guys think. Email me mailbag at WWE podcast.com. I'll try to get into as many of you as possible on the Wednesday night mailbag. No, uh, no promises, but you know, think again, things are starting to get uh, pretty filled up in the mailbag. So I'll do my best. Patrons, no matter what, I will always get to the patrons, so there is that benefit too. Um, I'm also going to be doing maybe some different things here. Um, I might be switching the software I use to uh, to make podcasts, which will allow me to do a lot more video for patrons, and the audio quality will also improve even further. Uh, bringing guests on will be easier. There might be video recordings of guests and things like that, and co-hosts. So th- the software is not cheap at all, but it may be an investment in the next, uh, you know, couple of days that I make, um, as well as, uh, purchasing a new iPhone that I don't need because I'm, uh, I can't help myself. I'm, I'm one of those idiots for technology. I just, you know, I purchase it for, you know, for, I don't even know what reason, you know, sometimes I just like, I feel like if I have an outdated model of something, it irritates me. And then I have to go out and buy that new model and sell the old one. And then I have to pay the difference. <laughs> so um, do you guys need to help support my technology addiction? So that's why you need to join Patreon. So my wife can keep yelling at me. Um, so anyway, all right, continue to go ad free. If you want ad free trials, free trials are available on Patreon and Apple podcasts. Uh, but don't forget the exclusive after dark show and video that I'll be start to do, starting to do this week is going to be exclusive to the SmackDown tier and above NXT tier, which is our lowest tier entry tier still allows for ad free, everything discord server, shout out and all that stuff. But that'll do it for me tonight, guys go to WWE podcast.com WWE podcast shop.com or use the link on our website. If you do Amazon shopping and that'll do it for me, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow on the mailbag. Take care and see you next time. Well, the NFL season is back, and that means your fantasy teams are being put to work. And I can tell you right now, for myself, I am not happy that I started Daniel Jones in my league. But I can tell you what I do like, and that is the Air It Out Fantasy Football League podcast. It's part of the Air It Out podcast network. It's hosted by longtime fantasy football players and friends, Joe and Chantel. And new episodes are released weekly. So every week, you guys are going to be able to get an episode to get your fantasy fill discussing all things fantasy football and everything noteworthy on the 2023 NFL season. And their highlight segment of the show is show up, show out, or a blank show. Like, you know where I'm going with that. 
where they make specific player predictions and recommendations and discuss which players show up, show out, or are a complete crap show, for lack of a better word, uh, for the week. And these guys are just getting started, okay? So they're going to need some love from you guys. Check them out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube, and much more. You can also follow and rate them. Click on the little alarm bell for notifications so you can see when new episodes are released. And you can also find them on Instagram on the Air It Out Network. Of course, the best way is on Apple and Spotify. But in the search, make sure you type in Air It Out FFL. You look for the red and black logo. That's where you'll be able to find them. Again, guys, Air It Out FFL, which is available on Apple and Spotify. Check out the Air It Out Fantasy Football League podcast. Thanks for listening to the WWE podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.